Chapter 12. Conclusion. But there is a law given and a punishment affixed, and a repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth, otherwise justice claimeth the creature and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment, if not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. Alma 42.22. Atonement. Through the atonement of Christ, man's sins are expiated or wiped away. The scope of atonement covers several segments of doctrine. 1. Through Adam's fall, all men become subject to death. The atonement provided the way for men to be made alive again. 2. All mankind have broken the spiritual and moral laws of God and justly are condemned from the presence of God. Atonement provides the means to restore them from that bondage. 3. Everyone is subject to sin. The law would condemn sinners to be destroyed, or they would have to make an atonement with their own blood. But the atonement of Jesus Christ has provided the means of redeeming and giving them a chance for salvation. Atonement has been described as at one meant, or an agreement made between man and God. Man, in his fallen nature, is unworthy to dwell in the presence of God, but by means of an atonement, man can be redeemed. However, all men have not sinned to the same degree, neither will they be redeemed to the same degree. Paul said that as one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. I Cor. 1541 to 42. Man cannot earn salvation, it is an offering given through the mercy and grace of God. It is a free gift on certain conditions of obedience, for Paul wrote that Christ became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Heb.59. However, one of the greatest fallacies of apostate Christianity today is that mere belief or confessing Jesus Christ means instant atonement and is all that is necessary for total salvation. But mere belief or vocalizing a word was not enough to obtain the favor of God in the Old or New Testament, and it is not enough now. If the whole world would say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it would not make them one whit better than they are. Ministers may pound the pulpit about believing and confessing Jesus, but even believers can be just as corrupt as unbelievers. The difference between the righteous and the wicked is the degree of obedience to the laws of God. There is no salvation until men turn from their sins. God cannot provide a saving power to people while they remain in their sins. When John the Baptist came out of the wilderness to announce the Messiah, he cried for the people to repent, not just believe in Jesus. Now then, the steps toward obtaining repentance have been explained as 1. Recognition of sin. 2. Refraining from it. 3. Reforming or realigning their life. 4. Restoring or reconciling any wrongs. 5 resigning oneself to obey the law. Here, then, is a synopsis of what the scriptures say concerning salvation through the atonement of Christ. 1. Grace. We are saved by the grace and mercy of Christ's atonement, in spite of all our belief, faith, good works, or confessions. Acts 15.11. 2. Belief. This gives him and his direction. Whatever he may believe in, is the course of life that he will follow. John 3.16. 3. Faith. We are justified by faith because it moves man to action. Through faith a man produces works or action. Gal. 3.11. 4. Works. By our works, we demonstrate the kind of belief or faith that we have. Belief, faith and works can be good or bad, true or false. And it is by our works that we are judged. John the Revelator spoke of the final judgment, and said he saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Dot, dot, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Rev. 20.12 And Paul the Apostle said that every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. I Cor. 3.8 These are a few of the principles in the spectrum of the gospel. They are all required to gain salvation through the atonement of Jesus Christ. To expand our understanding of the purpose of this mortal life, we may look first to the two trees in the Garden of Eden. They were figurative and were used to illustrate the principle of obedience and disobedience to God's laws and the freedom of man to make a choice. God could have killed the old serpent easier than man can kill one. God could have smitten the forbidden tree as easy as Jesus smote a tree. But God placed good and evil upon the earth for man to chose, according to his own free agency. Without freedom and the choice of good and evil, there could be no reward nor any punishment. Mortality was to be man's schoolhouse for salvation. The fall of man was predestined, just as the atonement of Christ was, for he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Rev. 13.8. Earldess and Rituals. 
Man is surrounded by physical, moral, scientific and spiritual laws. Each law is absolute with consistent results according to the way they are used. These laws are absolute because God's laws are all eternal, everlasting, and unchangeable. To every law there is a punishment or a blessing. This applies to the laws of the atonement as well. Throughout the history of scriptures, there are four main areas in which the doctrine of atonement has been applied. Blood has been shed within these four categories with a special effect or spiritual consequence. 1. The sacrifice of birds and animals. Atonement for sin was resolved by the shedding of blood of birds and animals as an evidence of their faith in the promised Messiah, who was to come and atone for their sins with his blood. 2. Shedding the blood of criminals. Execution by the shedding of criminals' blood was a. to be a just punishment for their crimes, b. to act as a partial atonement for their sin, and c. to keep sin from Israel and to keep sin from the land. 3. Shedding the blood of prophets and apostles. This had an effect upon the guilty who were the persecutors and murderers of holy men, whereas blood was a witness or testament against the wicked, bringing judgment against them. 4. Shedding the blood of Jesus Christ. The basis of the doctrine of blood atonement rests on an eternal and predestined atonement for all mankind by the shedding of the blood of Christ. Each of these four categories became a part of the doctrine of blood atonement. In the following pages, each will be carefully considered for the purpose it was administered or why it occurred, as they were not only sanctioned by God, but initiated and directed by Him. 1. Sacrifice of birds and animals. With man's introduction to the earth, the sacrifice of animals, by shedding their blood, also commenced. It was not a superstitious or pagan rite, but rather an act of obedience to God's commandment. Blood represented the medium by which all mankind could be saved and brought back into the presence of God. God gave constant reminders to his children of the importance of blood and the saving principles of atonement that were connected with it. Sin, and the atonement for sin, were imprinted in all the ordinances and rituals of the gospel. The children of Israel were commanded to put blood on their doorposts to protect them from the death of their firstborn. Who would imagine that blood smeared on a house would protect children from death? Nonetheless, their obedience was rewarded according to the promise. Again, a bullock and a goat were chosen, and the goat was committed to receive the sins of Israel. The bullock was killed and his blood would be an atonement for Israel, while the goat was turned free. This was to illustrate a principle. See Lev. 1620-27. The ancients practiced many kinds of sacrifices and offerings, including sin, guilt, peace, ordination, free will, burn cereal, drink, thanksgiving, votive, and many others. One of these, called the guilt offering, was commanded in instances when a party had suffered some infraction. It often required a recompense for their personal sin or violation of law. It was to repay for the period of his separation from God, and he had to bring a guilt offering as reparation for what he pledged and had failed to do. The violation of others' property rights could be atoned for only by the guilt offering, and its 20% fine attending it. Cheating robbery, oppression, false testimony and even the seduction of a betrothed slave girl was considered a violation of property rights. In each case the guilty party confessed his sin, made full restoration of the infraction of the law, and then offered the guilt offering. Repentance, restoration and atonement were all clearly illustrated. Paul said that the blood of bulls and of goats dot 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 sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Heb. 913. But, of course, these sacrifices dot 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 can never take away sins. Heb. 1011. The sacrifice of Christ by the shedding of his blood is the only atonement for salvation. 2. Shedding the blood of criminals. Anciently, there were some sins which were called the sins of the upraised hand, or as we call them high-handed sins. These sins were of such import that they could not be atoned for by the sacrificial ritual. It was in this category that all offenses worthy of death were placed. Few people recognize the severity of God's punishments for those who break His laws. He has controlled both the giving and the administration of those laws, and among them were laws governing the principle of capital punishment. In many instances God required the blood of sinners to be shed rather than the blood of animals. And, it is no less reasonable to believe that God would accept the shedding of the blood of a sinner for his crimes, than to believe that he would accept the blood of an animal for a man's crimes. Vicarious atonement is more difficult to have faith in than the actual atonement by the sinner. The shedding of Ma's blood was for his crimes, but in no way meant that it ceased done for his salvation, for that was accomplished by the sacrifice and atonement of Christ. God is not and will not require the ordinance of blood sacrifice or atonement, without purpose. 
even the sacrifice of Isaac by his father was a sin sacrifice or blood atonement. Isaac had committed some sin which Abraham viewed as serious enough to require the shedding of Isaac's blood. Heber C. Kimball referred to his. But God requires every man and woman to be faithful, and if they have sinned, they have got to make an atonement for that sin, and your trials do not make that atonement. God says that we shall be tried in all things, even as was Abraham of old. He was called upon to offer up his son, and was found willing to offer him up, but, as the sin was not sufficient to require the shedding of his son's blood, a lamb was provided, and its blood atoned for the sin that Abraham's son was to be offered up for, and saved the son. J.D. 4 120. To illustrate the payment or punishment of crimes in ancient Israel, one only needs to consider their severity. Capital punishment was imposed upon all who broke even the Ten Commandments, as the following references will show. 1. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Idolatry. Lev. 22, Dut. 13, 6, 17, 2 7. 2. Thou shalt not serve or bow down to any other likeness or images. False prophets. X. 22, 18, Lev. 26, 27, Dut. 13, 5, 18, 20, I Sam. 28, 9. 3. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Blasphemy. Lev. 24 14 16 23 I Kings 21 10 4 Remember the Sabbath day Sabbath violation X 31 14 35 2 Num 15 32 to 36 5 Honor thy father and thy mother Dishonoring parents X 21 15 17 6 Thou shalt not kill Murder Lev 24 17 21 7. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery. Lev. 2010. Dut. 2222. Incest. X. 2219. Unchastity. Lev. 219. Dut. 2221. Rape. Dut. 2225. 8. Thou shalt not steal. X. 2116. 9. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Dut. 1916-19. 10. Thou shalt not covet. Dut. 27-7. When Israel became aware of God's laws and powers, but sinned against them, then it constituted a rejection of God and His covenant with them. Such seemingly minor offenses were indeed major offenses against God. Consider capital punishment for the following transgressions in Israel. Refusing to eat the unleavened bread. Num. 9-13. Eating leavened bread during the Passover. X. 12 15, 19. Not observing the Day of Atonement. Lev. 23 29 30. Eating blood. Lev. 7 27, 17 14. Eating sacrifices while unclean. Lev. 7 20 21, 22 34. Eating peace offering too late. Lev. 19 8. Touching holy things without authority. Num. 4 15, 18, 20. Defiling the sanctuary by uncleanliness. Num. 19 13, 20. Misuse of holy ointment. X. 30 32, 33. Misuse of perfume. X. 30 38. Rebellion against authority. Num. 16. But the laws of God given to Israel were in no way obligatory or binding upon anyone else. Men are only punished or recompensed by the laws which they are obligated to obey. In other words, the laws of the United States are of no effect in Africa and vice versa. In our progressive society there are many who are so forgiving and kind that they allow for no punishment at all for many crimes. Some of the modern peddlers of Christianity might believe this as being Christ-like, but nothing could be further from the truth. If Christ is going to bring every idle word into judgment, Matt, 1236, surely no one guilty of murder will escape. Men must first understand the law and its consequences, then if they transgress, they know they must pay the penalty. The greater the knowledge, the greater the penalty. To quote Brigham Young. Brother Willie has said, the time is not far distant, but it will never come until the inhabitants of the earth, and especially those who have been gathered together, have a sufficient time to be educated in the celestial law, so that each person may understand for himself. Then if they transgress against the light and knowledge they possess, some will be stoned to death, and judgment will be laid to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. 
But people will never be taken and sacrificed for their ignorance when they have had no opportunity to know and understand the truth, such a proceeding would be contrary to the economy of heaven. But after we receive and understand things as they are, if we then disobey we may look for the chastening hand of the Almighty. JD 3246. And again he predicted that this penalty of men having their blood shed for crimes would return. The wickedness and ignorance of the nations forbid this principle's blood atonement being in full force, but the time will come when the law of God will be in full force. Brigham Young, JD 4220. Modern Christians condemn the Mormons for their view of blood atonement, but they fail to look into their own theological position and to cleanse their own sanctuary. Adolf Hitler was a Catholic, but for his destruction upon humanity he was never excommunicated from the Church. Mussolini nearly bathed his country in blood, but he was never dropped from the ranks of the Catholics. How many Catholics and Protestants were dropping bombs on each other during World War II? Strangely enough, they do not believe in blood atonement or capital punishment, yet they have been destroying each other for centuries. God allows the wicked to destroy each other for not honoring and administering his laws. As Apostle Orson Pratt said, when the Almighty determines to punish nations for their sins, he not unfrequently accomplishes his purposes through the medium of war. By this desolating scourge, towns, cities, and whole countries have been laid waste, nations, kingdoms, and empires have been overturned, the earth itself has been converted into an immense slaughterhouse. The science of human butchery has been studied, systematized, and brought to great perfection. Frightful engines of destruction have been invented, and millions trained, in the most skillful manner, in the art of taking human life. The most bold, wily, maneuvering, wholesale murderer is applauded as a hero, and titled colonel, or a general, and is respected, honored, and renowned in proportion to the number of victims which he and his co-butchers have been able to slaughter. War is considered a time-honored institution, calculated to render its martyrs immortal, and ensure to them an entrance into the gates of celestial paradise, under these soul-inspiring thoughts, pretended Christians go to war with pretended Christians. Christians have gotten sick of this vain world and desire to leave it. About 75 millions of them have concluded to have some big meetings, to assist one another in the holy work of getting to heaven by means of steel and gunpowder. To strengthen them for the pious and holy work of bloodletting, brain spilling, and such like tokens of Christian love, all are commanded to partake of the Holy Communion. After these religious preliminaries are concluded, it is to be expected that these Christians will greet each other with a smile of unbounded love, and in their great enthusiasm, send each other to heaven by scores of thousands at a time. Oh, the soul-chilling horrors of modern Christianity! What a ghastly spectacle for honest men and holy angels to behold, Christians drunk with the blood of Christians! Madly raging, with demoniac yells, brother furiously encounters brother, plunging the deadly steel in each other's hearts. Shrieking, groaning, writhing, their bodies yield to the grim monster death, and their spirits drag down to hell, suffer the dreadful vengeance of eternal justice. Mill. Star 28 409 11. Hal Lindsay, in his bestseller, The Late Great Planet Earth, quoted Jesus who spoke of the last days, and that there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Matt. 2421. Lindsay also interpreted Rev. 1420 to mean that this would be a time of great bloodshed. Said he. The Apostle John predicts that so many people will be slaughtered in the conflict, that blood will stand to the horses' bridles for a total of 200 miles. Great Late Planet Earth, page 165. The pages of history are filled with countless numbers of people who have been destroyed or killed. Why does God allow these things to happen to his children? He loves them, but when they fill their cup with iniquity, he has no other choice than to bring judgment and justice upon them for their crimes and sins. Whether it be one individual or millions, they must learn that there is a penalty affixed to every transgression. Although times have changed in Utah and the nation, it does not prove that they have become more civilized. Law officials, clergymen, and the citizens are crying for more severe penalties for those who commit so many heinous crimes. Some of those who should be in the forefront to expound the law are backing away from it. In Spencer W. Kimball's book The Miracle of Forgiveness, he not only failed to mention blood atonement as pertinent to those guilty of murder, but he failed even to make mention of capital punishment. Bruce R. McConkie said, There simply is no such thing among us as a doctrine of blood atonement that grants a remission of sins or confers any other benefit upon a person, because his own blood is shed for sins. There is no such a doctrine as blood atonement in the church today, nor has there been at any time. 
any statements to the contrary are either idle speculation or pure fantasy. It is certainly not the current teaching of the Church, and I have never in over sixty years of regular Church attendance heard a single sermon on the subject or even a discussion in any Church class. Dialogue 7 1, Letter to Thomas McAfee, October 18, 1978. Strangely enough, Elder McConkie previously had said, But under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing of Christ does not operate, and the law of God is that men must then have their blood shed to atone for their sins. Murder, for instance, is one of these sins, hence, we find the Lord commanding capital punishment. Mormon Doctrine, page 92. And again, as a mode of capital punishments hanging or execution on a gallows, does not comply with the law of blood atonement, for the blood is not shed. Mormon Doctrine, page 314, 1958 edition. Those who are obligated to subscribe to the moral or civil law, expect to be punished if they break that law. Crime and sin must be punished. That punishment serves society by 1. Awarding a penalty in proportion to the crime. 2. It protects society by containing criminals. 3. It acts as a deterrent for crime. 4. It elevates society in safety and protection. 5. It complies to the laws of God. The purpose or objective of human government is to function as nearly as possible to God's laws. By doing so, they receive the blessings of God and the merits affixed to His laws. But the punishments of all just laws should be administered in the following pattern. 1. Legally constituted authorities are appointed. 2. Punishment must be in proportion to the crime. 3. Equitable justice applies to all, regardless of who they may be. 4. Execution must be done without malice and with a realization of the merits of that punishment. 5. Compassion and consideration must be included. 6. Witnesses and testimony must be sufficient to condemn any criminal. These procedures show that Mormons do not block or control civil courts with their doctrine of blood atonement. Neither should any civil authorities interfere with the right of a Mormon who wishes to die according to the biblical doctrine of blood atonement. The more completely understand this section on shedding the blood of criminals, it is important to know that crime and its punishment relate to civil law, however, sin and its atonement relate to religious law. Punishment of a criminal is generally in for 3. Shedding the blood of prophets. It seems strange that God has so often allowed his prophets to be slain for their testimony. Yet, there was a purpose and a reason for it. Jesus mentioned the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world with a special recognition. He explained that it would be a witness against the wicked. Paul the Apostle added, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Heb. 916-17. Jesus made no attempt to save himself from crucifixion, even though it was his own desire to have that cup pass away. He did nothing to save John the Baptist from having his head cut off. Jesus did not offer protection to Peter, but rather told him that he would suffer death in the same manner that he would. He even indicated that all the other apostles would also die by their enemies, except John. Why? So that their testimony would be sealed with their blood. Joseph Smith was not an exception. From the very rise of the church, the Lord hinted that he, too, would be required to lay down his life as many of the ancient prophets had done. Those prophets had known and even prophesied of that event. Cleansing of the Sanctuary One of the most interesting scriptures, and to some Protestant churches, the most important, deals with the prophet Daniel's vision concerning the cleansing of the sanctuary. Many of the best ecclesiastical scholars have studied this scripture with particular interest because it refers to events that will precede the second coming of Christ. The Adventists have closely analyzed and interpreted this prophetic timetable and concluded that these events would transpire in the year 1844. A multitude of other Protestants were also caught up in the signs of the times, believing that 1844 would be the year of the second coming of the Savior. Many even sold or gave away their property and possessions, and awaited this great rapture. Some went to the top of hills or mountains to be close to his appearance. But the prophet Joseph Smith said, I have asked of the Lord concerning his coming, and while asking the Lord, he gave a sign and said, dot, 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 Whenever you see the rainbow withdrawn, it shall be a token that there shall be famine, pestilence, and great distress among the nations, and that the coming of the Messiah is not far distant.
but I will take the responsibility upon myself to prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come this year, as Father Miller has prophesied, for we have seen the bow, and I also prophesy in the name of the Lord that Christ will not come in forty years, and if God ever spoke by my mouth, he will not come in that length of time. Brethren, when you go home, write it down, that it may be remembered. TPJS, page 340-341. Thus, the year 1844 came and passed without any significant fulfillment of the statement of Daniel which said, Unto two thousand and three hundred days years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Dan. 814, Ellen G. White, the noted writer for the Adventists, wrote, These prophetic days had been shown to terminate in the autumn of 1844. In common with the rest of the Christian world, Adventists then held that the earth or some part of it was the sanctuary. But the appointed time had passed, and the Lord had not appeared. The believers knew that God's word could not fail, their interpretation of the prophecy must be at fault. But where was the mistake? See the great controversy, chapter 23. The only sanctuary the Bible mentions is the temple that was built by Solomon, and the portable sanctuary built by Moses. While further commented that the cleansing, both in the typical and in the real service, must be accomplished with blood. These scriptures, interpreted according to the Protestants, summarize the following incidents. 1. A major event would occur in the summer of 1844. 2. This event would be evidence that the second coming of Christ was nigh at hand. 3. The sanctuary was a temple of the Lord, which was a part of the new covenant of Jesus Christ. 4. The sanctuary, or temple, contained an inner veil, a holy of holies, and the law of God for his true followers. 5. The cleansing of the sanctuary must be accomplished as it was anciently with the shedding of blood. Since, according to the Protestants' limited knowledge, none of these things were fulfilled in the summer of 1844, they concluded that they must have taken place in heaven. As usual, the Protestants fail to accept or to understand that the fulfillment of so many prophecies are coincidental with Mormonism. It was in the summer of 1844 that the Mormon temple was being completed. It had the inner veil, a holy of holies, and the revealed word of God had been published for the true disciples of Christ. All of this was evidence of the new covenant of the gospel. Also when Joseph Smith, the prophet of this dispensation was killed, as it happened to many former prophets, he sealed his testimony of that new covenant, and when his blood was shed, the prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled. 4. Shedding the blood of Jesus Christ. No event has equaled the profound impact on man or the earth that occurred with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. From the fall of Adam to the last person on earth, the crucifixion is an integral part of man's history. The atonement of Christ becomes a reconciliation between God and man when men accept it. But, when man sins, then he must make amends not to appease God's wrath, nor pay the devil's due, but to reconcile the debt of breaking a divine law. When this is accomplished, his salvation can be assured because of Christ's atonement. Mormons believe in a just reward or a just punishment, depending on one's obedience or disobedience to the laws of God. There is no instantaneous popcorn salvation. Merely saying a few words does not spring open the heavenly gates to every murderer, whoremonger or reprobate. All the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah is too overwhelming to doubt. The scriptures show the need for a Savior, the ordinances symbolize His coming, and numerous prophecies were made concerning that event. At the crucifixion over twenty-three ancient prophecies were fulfilled. All of the rituals and teachings of the Old Testament prepared the people for the teachings and ordinances that Christ would bring. Many events recorded in the Bible were symbolic of the coming of Christ, such as the circumstances surrounding the lives of Noah and Moses. Noah was surrounded with sin and sinners. By water, wickedness was washed away and the earth was baptized and made new again. Men would learn that they, too, must wash away their sins by baptism through the mercy and atonement of Christ. The three great religions of the world Christian, Jewish and Mohammedan all, regard Moses as a great spiritual leader, lawgiver, miracle worker and prophet of God. Jesus would be greater than he. The life of Moses had been predicted by the prophets, and so had Christ's. Pharaoh pronounced death to all the young males to prevent Moses from being king over Israel. Herod did the same at the birth of Jesus. Though the mother of Moses sought to save her son by getting him out of Egypt, the mother of Christ took her son into Egypt to save him. When Moses went up on the mountain to speak with God, he fasted forty days, and when Jesus went out to be with God, he, too, fasted forty days. Moses gave them the word of God and the law. Jesus would give them a higher law. Moses had the right to become the king over all of Egypt, but was rejected. 
Christ came to be the King of the Jews, and he was rejected also. Moses performed over twenty miracles, manifesting the power of God. Christ performed countless miracles in only three years of his ministry. Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage and sin. Jesus, through his atonement, would lead them into eternal life. Moses became a shadow of Christ, and he also prophesied of him by saying, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Num. 2417, again he prophesied that the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Dut. 1815. So similar were the lives of Moses and Christ that the parallels cannot be refuted. The Old Testament is nothing more than a series of stories, prophecies, and ordinances that point to the coming of Jesus Christ, the New Testament is the fulfillment of those promises. The evidences of these histories combined with the spirit of truth convince men that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah, and that with the shedding of his blood, an atonement was made. Jesus became the only perfect being to live on the earth. He fulfilled the requirements of all the laws and was a manifestation of the perfection of the Father. For those who have wanted to see what kind of being God is, they need only look to his Son. Jesus was the legal representative of the Father in authority, and his life demonstrated God's teachings. For man to become Christ's representative on earth, he must exemplify Christ by purging iniquity from his character, by guarding his every thought, word, and deed. As Jesus expressed the Father in his life, so should every man seek to reflect the image of Christ in themselves. The world, in general, failed to appreciate and understand the love, the sacrifice and the importance of Jesus Christ, but somewhere in eternity men shall come to that realization. As Paul, the Apostle, said, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Phil, 2-9-11. It was through the fall of Adam that sin and death were introduced, but through the atonement of Christ, life eternal and freedom from sin are offered. This world provides many sorrows, but Christ leads men to joy. His blood turns mortality into immortality. In some future day all men will acknowledge and recognize that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, John 15-13, and they will know that Jesus expressed that love for them. More precious than the value of all the treasures on earth is the gift of atonement that Jesus Christ offered all mankind. Truly he is the Savior of the world.